Hi, thank you. Um, uh, so I'll be talking today about a combination of n-body simulations uh, with high-pressure partitioning experiments and how we can use this to learn about the chemical evolution of terrestrial planetary cores. And I'd like to start by thanking my uh, collaborators on this project, Andy Campbell and Fred Chesla. So the main question that we're trying to answer with this project is how do core formation conditions and the accretion history of a terrestrial planet affect its core composition? And throughout this talk today, I'm going to be uh, mostly using the Earth as our example um, so that we can make comparisons to geophysical and geochemical data. Uh, most previous studies that have looked at core formation in the Earth have either used uh, a single pressure temperature point or a prescribed pressure temperature path. And there was a, a recent advance here uh, in a, a study by Ruby et al. that used four n-body simulations to describe planetary growth, uh, which were run using the, the grand TAC model. Um, they used these simulations to then uh, back out sort of best fitting uh, core formation conditions and initial compositions in the solar system. Our goal here is a little different. Uh, we're using a significantly larger number of simulations. We've run 100 so far, and we're combining them uh, with partitioning data to uh, explore the effects of different physical processes on core formation chemistry. Uh, so we start with a, a large number of simulations, we combine it with our uh, partitioning experiments um, so that we can model uh, core and mantle compositions that are produced under evolving pressure, temperature, and oxygen fugacity conditions. So we start by running the n-body simulations. Uh, these were run using the Mercury code from John Chambers, and these are uh, high-resolution simulations. We start with over 2,000 bodies uh, plus Jupiter and Saturn. We've run a total of 100 of them. Uh, that's 50 for each of two sets of initial conditions. Uh, so that's an, about an order of magnitude more than most previous studies have run per set of initial conditions. And there are several advantages uh, to doing things this way. Uh, one is that it allows us to look for statistical correlations between our ability to match different solar system properties. Um, by doing this, we can make sure that the simulations that we use in our modeling uh, actually provide plausible growth histories for the Earth. We also get a chance to observe low probability events uh, and quantify their probabilities. Um, for example, we see Mars formation uh, only a few percent of the time. Uh, we also get a, a good sense of the variability that's possible, the, the range of variation that a planet can experience in its accretion history. Uh, so there's two main types of information that we extract from these simulations for our core formation modeling. Um, the first is the mass evolution of the Earth analog. Um, so here I'm plotting the, the mass fraction of the Earth as a function of time for 50 of our 100 simulations. And you can see that there's uh, a lot of variability um, in the way that a planet grows and the sizes of, of impacts that it experiences. And the other type of information that we get from these simulations uh, is the provenance of the Earth's building blocks. So uh, in this figure on the lower left, I'm plotting the mass fraction of the Earth analog uh, as a function of where that material originated in the solar system. Uh, this thick white curve here uh, is the average over 50 of our simulations, and the thin blue lines are examples of individual runs. You can see that some of them uh, very closely track the average, but some are, are extremely different. Um, and so by running such a large number, we can really capture this type of variability that's possible. Um, so we have uh, these two types of information that we get from simulations, the mass evolution of a planet and the provenance. Um, and so uh, if we want to use this to model core chemistry, we also need to know something about the chemical reactions that are taking place inside the growing planet while it's accreting. So to do that, uh, we performed a series of high pressure, high temperature metal silicate partitioning experiments. And we did these experiments in a laser heated diamond anvil cell, uh, which allows us to achieve higher pressures and temperatures than most previous studies uh, on this type of partitioning. Um, in fact, we can achieve uh, peak pressures that actually exceed core formation conditions in the Earth so that we can uh, interpolate rather than extrapolate our data. And we've been looking at the partitioning of nickel, cobalt, vanadium, chromium, silicon, and oxygen between uh, metallic and silicate melts. Uh, the recovered uh, samples at ambient condition are sectioned using a focused ion beam and analyzed chemically using a transmission electron microscope. Uh, in the lower left here, you see uh, an image of one of our samples in the TEM. Um, this one was recovered from 100 GPA and 5500 Kelvin. Uh, you see the, the quenched metallic melt in black surrounded by the quenched silicate melt. And at these uh, conditions, we actually see about twice as much light element in the metal than the Earth's core is thought to contain. 
And we quantify partitioning uh, using the exchange coefficient, KD, which is uh, defined in the upper right. KD is basically a measure of how siderophile an element is. So a higher value of KD uh, means an element is more likely to partition into the metal. So here I'm plotting, uh, as an example, uh, log KD is a function of inverse temperature for silicon. Um, the data are color-coded by pressure, and our data are these uh, filled triangles here. And we fit uh, all of the available data on all six elements uh, to an equation of this functional form. And so with these parameterizations, uh, we can calculate the compositions of coexisting metal and silicate melts for any pressure and temperature. Um, so that's the type of information we need uh, to begin to construct a model of core formation chemistry. Again, we get the, the growth history and initial locations uh, of the materials from the n-body simulations. Uh, in this modeling, we assign each body an initial composition based on where it started out in the solar system. These, these compositions are uh, basically a CI chondrite that's been equilibrated at variable oxygen fugacity. Uh, we then uh, allow things to uh, uh, collide and undergo high pressure, high temperature metal silicate partitioning uh, in a model that was inspired by Ruby et al. 2011. Um, when a, a target um, is uh, impacted, the impactor's metal equilibrates with its own silicate at 60% of the core mantle boundary pressure of the target and the liquidus temperature at that pressure. Uh, the new uh, metal and silicate compositions are calculated using mass balance equations and experimentally determined partition coefficients, like the ones I showed on the previous slide. Uh, and our model includes uh, these 13 elements so far. Um, so after this equilibration calculation is performed, the impactor's metal gets added to the Earth's core and the impactor's silicate gets mixed back into the Earth's mantle. Um, so that the resulting core composition of the Earth represents an integration over a range of pressure temperature conditions uh, of different equilibration steps. So here's an example of the, the type of information we get out of a model like this. And these three plots are histograms of the oxygen and silicon contents of the Earth's core that are produced in our 100 simulations. Um, on the far left uh, is a case um, where all of the material in the simulation is initially very reduced. So everything uh, starts out at three and a half log units below the iron wustite buffer. Uh, on the far right is our oxidized end member case where everything uh, is initially at IW minus one and a half. And in the middle um, is a case where there's a step function. So everything uh, that starts out inside of 2AU is reduced and everything that starts outside of 2AU is more oxidized. And this is uh, sort of the reference case that I'll be using for the rest of the talk. And so as you might expect, uh, if things start out very reduced, we get more silicon in the core, and if things start out more oxidized, we get more oxygen in the core. Uh, what's interesting here is that, uh, on average, we get at least a few weight percent of both light elements into the core um, in every case, which is not what you would expect based on the low pressure behavior of these elements. Uh, these figures show how uh, a planet's core chemistry can be a sensitive record of its accretion history. So in this case, uh, how the silicon and oxygen contents of a planet's core reflect the oxidation state of its building blocks. And there's some variability that we see from simulation to simulation, uh, which is why there's some width to these distributions. And some of that variability is due to differences in the mass of the Earth analog. Uh, so planets of different sizes produce different compositions. And some of this variability is due to differences in accretion history. So what the Earth analog accreted uh, as a function of time and the stochasticness of giant impacts. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll point out that the compositions uh, we're producing here are consistent with geophysical measurements of the Earth's core density. Um, for example, some of our, our previous studies have constrained the core to contain uh, 11 weight percent silicon or 8 weight percent oxygen to match the observed density. We can also use this model to look at the trace element abundances of the Earth's mantle. So elements like nickel, cobalt, vanadium, and chromium are often used to sort of fingerprint core formation conditions in the Earth. Uh, this figure in the upper right plots uh, the abundance of nickel oxide in the mantle uh, as a function of, of mass fraction of Earth accreted in three of our 100 simulations. And these three simulations produce Earth analogs of the same mass. So the variability you see here in the, the final mantle composition is due solely to differences in what the Earth accreted as a function of time. Uh, in the lower left here, you see the, the histogram of our final um, nickel oxide contents of the mantle in our simulations. Uh, we find an average of 2,900 ppm in the mantle with a, a fairly large standard deviation of 1,000. 
uh, which is compatible with the Earth's uh, measured composition of 2,500 ppm. And it's a, a very similar story for cobalt, which is shown in the bottom right here. Um, so the, the bottom line here is that the same uh, core formation conditions that gave us plausible core compositions in terms of the light element content are also uh, providing a good match to the Earth's um, mantle trace element composition. Um, another factor that we're starting uh, to incorporate into this model is the effects of partial equilibration of the core. Um, so it's thought that uh, sometimes uh, during an impact, the impactor's metal merges with the Earth's core before having time to fully equilibrate with the magma ocean, uh, especially in cases where the impactor is large and differentiated. Uh, estimates of the degree of equilibration vary from about 30 to 80 percent uh, based on geochemical arguments. Um, so here uh, on the left, I'm showing the same figure I showed in the previous slide, uh, the nickel oxide content of the mantle in our different simulations. Uh, to remind you, this is the case of uh, the impactor metal totally equilibrating at 60 percent of the core mantle boundary pressure. Um, now in the middle is the case of partial equilibration. So here only 40% of the impactor's metal equilibrates. The other 60% gets added directly to the Earth's core. You can see that in this case, uh, we end up with significantly lower abundances of nickel and cobalt in the Earth's mantle, and also significantly lower amounts of light elements in the Earth's core. Uh, but interestingly, uh, the effects of partial equilibration can be largely compensated for by changing the depth of equilibration. Um, so on the right, we're showing the case of, again, 40% equilibration, but now it's 75% of the core mantle boundary pressure. Uh, and we largely recover the mantle and core composition from the total equilibration case. Um, so in conclusion, uh, in this talk today, I've shown how we can combine accretion simulations with partitioning data uh, in a novel way, and that this type of model gives us more information about the evolution of a, a planet's core chemistry than we could get from either type of study alone. A uh, planet's accretion history has a significant effect on its composition, and uh, uh, in particular, its core composition can be a sensitive record of this. Uh, due to variability in a planet's accretion history, it's important to use a large number of simulations uh, to look at the range of variability that's possible. And finally, with a type of model like this, we can begin to investigate which factors are the most important in determining a planet's core composition, and which of these important factors have the largest associated uncertainties. And so like that, we can better target future experimental and numerical studies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? You showed that uh, with this, uh, the, the depth of the equilibration pressure, uh, it has a, an impact on your results. So what was the reason for uh, choosing it at 60% of the uh, core mantle boundary? Uh, it's a nice round number. Um, <laughs> it's similar to results that previous studies have found, uh, like Ruby et al. 2011. Uh, we haven't done any sort of fine tuning to sort of find like the best fitting conditions, but it's one that gives us plausible uh, compositions in terms of both the mantle and core composition. Charlie? From your partition data, it's clearly very much going to be dependent on temperature. So I wonder how the temperature of equilibration is Ah, so uh, for all the data I've shown here, it's just the liquidus temperature at the pressure of equilibration. Um, that's definitely something that can uh, be played with. I guess based on the, the previous talk, it might be something to look at in the future. Um, but I'm expecting that uh, changing the temperature of equilibration would have a, a similar effect to changing the depth of equilibration, um, since those are highly correlated. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Absolutely. 
I agree completely. There are too many unknowns, really, to, to give a, a definite answer about the problem. But, but we can start to play around with these unknown parameters and see uh, which ones are, are we the most sensitive to and which ones do we really need to target.